Hello and welcome to the I2V2 Transmart Foundation community meeting for March of 2020. My name is Rudy Potenzone and uh, I will try to uh, expedite the meeting and uh, keep us moving. Um, today we have uh, an, an interesting agenda. Hopefully you'll, uh, you'll find it uh, quite interesting. Um, but uh, as usual, we'll start out with some foundation updates and news. So let me introduce Diane Keogh, the Managing Director of the Foundation. Diane. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining um, for wherever you are. Probably uh, a lot of you are working from home, um, as am I. Um, I hope everyone is um, doing well um, today and, um, and staying healthy. So I'm going to run through the foundation update pretty quickly because I definitely want to get to the, um, the, the last agenda item. So Rudy can go to the next slide. Just a couple of things I want to mention. Um, you know, we're, we're still hopeful that the June Harvard meeting um, will take place. Um, please uh, feel free to, to register for that event. Um, in the event that it gets canceled, um, and we're hoping it won't, but in the event that it gets canceled, we are gonna, uh, uh, we are gonna set up a virtual meeting because I think it's uh, very important. So um, next slide, Rudy. Um, I think we've seen, this, we've got some pretty meaty agenda items uh, talking about the future of the foundation and, and a lot of um, exciting roadmap um, uh, information. Um, based on the uh, current events, we could actually um, be, be adding a few other talks to this uh, agenda, so um, it will be changing. So maybe you can go to the next slide. So that's the first day. The second day will be uh, our working groups and a, a half day act session. Um, next slide. So I wanted to mention one additional thing, um, and you may have seen this in the, the monthly um, newsletter that came out last week. Um, springtime is the time for um, nominations for our board of directors. Um, we're really focusing on broadening the diversity of the board and, oops, too. Sorry, um, I'm, it looks like I'm not sharing the slides, maybe. Oh, okay. I thought I was. No, it says I'm sharing. People can't see the slides, really? I got I a message. I see you see them, right? Okay, I just wanted to check and make sure. Yeah. All right, keep going, sorry. All right, so we're, we're interested in broadening the diversity of, the, of our board of directors. Um, so what we've decided to do is to open the nominations to the entire community. Um, in the past, it was it was really sent to the the hundred or so people that we have um, as official members. Um, but I think it's it's important that um, the whole community participate in this. Um, so the nominations are open now, um, and again, um, you can you can go to this link, um, or it is on the newsletter that we sent out. Um, they are open now between now and April seventeenth. Um, the uh, um, we currently have 13 members and there, there's, there'll be three open seats um, that we're trying to fill. Um, the board will actually elect the new, the new board members, um, taking into account the diversity goal that we have. And the first meeting will take place um, hopefully in, in person on June um, the 11th. So next slide, Rudy. Here is a list of the current um, uh, board members. Um, with uh, three open seats. Um, the board uh, plays a really critical um, role in the foundation, helping us provide overall strategic direction. Um, they're also, they also help in promoting and communicating the goals of the foundation. Um, and they also play a critical role in helping us um, uh, provide sponsorship funding or identify new sponsors. Um, and they meet um, on a quarterly basis. And one of those meetings are in person. So please, if you have questions about this, you can reach out to me um, uh, separately or um, certainly um, nominate uh, people who you think would be interested or nominate yourself if you're interested. So next slide, Rudy. And I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thanks. Um, in terms of platform news, the ITB2 version 1.7.12 has been out. Uh, we're seeing uh, people uh, loading it and upgrading. So we encourage you to, you're using ITB2, consider upgrading um, to the new version. Uh, there's a lot of information on the wiki as well. 
Uh, this has been a, a community effort to bring a, a number of pieces together. It shows the collaborators for this version. And uh, we anticipate this being the, the normal progression um, of things. So if you have plugins that you're working on and would like to contribute, um, please contact the ITB2 group. We are happy to, to announce that Transmart version 19 is about finished. It should be uh, ready, hopefully, by uh, the end of the week or early next week. Uh, and it will be out there. Uh, again, a lot of information on the, um, the wiki in terms of the, the content of the release. Uh, this is um, the next uh, continuing uh, version um, from 16.3, which was released uh, a year ago. And um, we encourage you, if you're uh, looking to, to upgrade, this is a, you know, we think this is going to be a very strong version uh, for, the, for the platform. So um, as you may know, you should probably know, AMIA was canceled, but uh, we had a very interesting seminar planned on I2B2 uh, at that meeting. It was an all day seminar. And uh, the organizers of that, uh, I think are online and uh, we're going to talk uh, about it. Um, Kavi and Jeff, are you there? Hey, this is Kavi. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks for the slide. Sure. Um, so really the intent of the workshop uh, was to help uh, new users, the naive users uh, to come in. We always have uh, advanced stuff that we discuss at the uh, annual meeting. Uh, but uh, the intent over here was to really open it up to the community and start with the very basics. Uh, that is installing, uh, really first beginning with how to query uh, I to be to using the web client to build cohorts, and then how to quickly install I to be to, and then to quickly load data. That was uh, kind of the main focus. Uh, but then also cover a lot of other, uh, uh, introduce a lot of other work that is happening. Uh, if you look at the slide, you can see, uh, you know, we're thinking of how, we're talking a bit about the source code, how, you know, how it, where it lives and how it is organized. Uh, some work on uh, ontologies, how really to, uh, you know, run I2B2 on other data models like OMOP. How privacy is handled inside I2B2. Uh, we've been developing a REST API uh, to fetch data from I2B2, you know, read and write. Uh, this, uh, this new construct of derived concepts wherein you can insert algorithms inside I2B2 and I2B2 would uh, run them over the data and make available to you what we call as the right facts. Uh, there's been existing work on NLP, uh, which has been done previously. Uh, and uh, we've had we've had a proof of concept implementation of FHIR. And there are many other folks who have done FHIR implementations. Uh, there are many different FHIR implementations on I2B2. And other stuff like uh, you know, temporal query, not all of us are aware of how to use that. Multi-fact tables, uh, this functionality is available in I2B2, but uh, really how do we deploy it? And I mentioned about importing data. So we kind of have this listing of things and you know, uh, the interest over here was, uh, you know, as Diane wanted to know, like what is the community really interested in? And uh, so this remains to be our this will remain our agenda for the AMIA annual conference. Uh, we propose this there, uh, but I thought Diane felt that it's a good idea to find out uh, how much of this makes sense for the uh, for, for the cohort on this call. Handing it back to Diane. Uh, okay. So is there any feedback? Is, is there any feedback on this call? What, what what do people feel? Is this like a good agenda or what? You know, are there any suggestions uh, anyone has on this on this group? And everyone, anybody can unmute their mic and and talk here. Now there's a question in the chat window: Is the seminar happening then online? No, it's um, not happening at the AMIA CRI. Yeah. Uh, the conference was cancelled. We don't. We don't have it. Yeah. 
so we've had some discussion uh, about, you know, sh would this be a, a topic for like one of our training webinars or should we have a special webinar to cover this? And I guess part of the question here is just trying to find out what interest there would be in such a, you know, such a session. And, and would you be willing to, to attend? So you can, you know, if you have any thoughts, um, I see one chat comment from yes, Michelle. Michelle. Yep. Uh, Michelle was she, saying uh, topics uh, are great, and we should, especially the rest for the rest API yes. info. So yeah, I, I think we mentioned the rest API at the last annual uh, annual meeting. So yep. rest API had got the maximum interest. You know, when we did a vote at that time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, we'll we'll talk about you know we'll see if we can we can arrange something, um, maybe a couple of the uh, you know we could put a couple of these topics as individual uh, training seminars. So, all right, thank you, thanks, Kavi, appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, Diane, you want to introduce David? I'm gonna catch you off guard. No, no, I couldn't get off mute. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, David um, Hanauer, so from University of Michigan, has developed. Um, I I met him um, in at an AMIA meeting last fall, and he's from the University of Michigan, and he has developed um, an open source application that, um, and he can go into it a whole lot more, but it it really focuses on. Um, uh, patient notes, uh, integrating patient notes into this application and allowing people to search for these notes. And it's pretty exciting. It, it certainly is um, a separate application from I2B2, but I think um, this is a very hot topic and, and very uh, pertinent to, um, to the work that we do. And so I'm pretty excited about um, uh, having David at this meeting and jumping in and, and talking more about this application. So David, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, David, I stopped screen share. You can share your screen. Okay. Can everybody okay. see that? So hopefully I am unmuted and you can all hear me. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk. And I know it's probably so difficult for all of you to, to uh, even attend today. We're, we're at home with three school-aged children trying to make everything work at the moment. But so far, it's been okay. So what I'll talk to you today is about eMERS, a, a search engine for the medical record. I'll start with some slides and then I'll move into a, a brief uh, live demonstration. Hopefully that will work and then we can take some questions afterwards. Uh, the first thing is- you, um, Sorry, David, could you go to presentation mode to, just to make it a little yeah. bigger? Do that. Perfect, thank okay. you. So uh, I don't actually think I've, I, I think uh, I haven't linked to it yet, but these slides will be at uh, the link below. Um, so. The, this link will be in all the slides. You don't need to copy it down now, and it sounds like you'll be making them available to people anyway. Uh, as I mentioned, sort of this is the, uh, the roadmap for today. So first, what is Emers? Well, it's a search engine, kind of like Google, for free text medical record documents. Technically, it's an information retrieval system. Uh, it was designed to be simple to use, and it was designed to be a self-serve system, sort of in the way that I2B2 was meant to be designed to be uh, self-serve by, by researchers. It's a tool available at no cost. It has Apache 2.0 licensing. It does require local implementation, but I think that people who use I2B2 understand that because they've had to implement I2B2 themselves. And I think it's important to emphasize that picking the right tool for your research is very important. And oftentimes you do need multiple tools to get a job done. So I'm sure you all know this, but just very briefly, EMERS is really meant for the unstructured or free text data. This is sort of the narrative notes that we find in the medical record that describe patient encounters, courses, et cetera. I2B to act is really for the structured data, the things that kind of fit into the Excel spreadsheets that um, sort of are more things like white blood cell count, total cholesterol, demographics, et cetera, diagnoses, billing codes. It has been estimated uh, that about 80% of EHR data are in the unstructured free text. Now it's hard to get exact numbers for this, but, um, but that's sort of what people have estimated in the past. And I'm not gonna go through all these, but these are just quotes from various research papers that you can look up yourselves. 
that basically uh, are just saying that when people have tried to only use structured data, they're often missing important details or not getting the nuance or context that they would if they were also using the uh, free text data as well. Well, one thing that Emers is not, and it's important to emphasize this, it's not a natural language processing tool or NLP. But sometimes full NLP might not always be needed, and, uh, and I don't want to start any fights here, but NLP can often be hard to use or customize. Uh, it's not easy to take something out of the box and just get it working. You often need experts to help you get it working for a specific project. So there is sort of like a, a tug of war between these kind of concepts. And, and again, it's sort of like picking the right tool. But I would, I would sort of say that Emers is kind of like augmented intelligence. It doesn't do things automatically for you but it will help you find things quickly so that you can then use your own brain and intelligence to interpret the context of how something appears in the note. NLP, of course, being artificial intelligence for the most part, where it's going to try to, uh, based on how it's been trained, uh, identify concepts and extract them uh, automatically without uh, oversight once it sort of gets running. But again, these are different tools and depending on your use case, you may need one or the other or both. So one thing the Emers will allow you to do is find cohorts based on things mentioned in the notes. This could be diseases, drugs, symptoms, or really just anything that's mentioned in the notes. So it's perfect for finding things like diagnoses that don't have a specific ICD-10 code. So for example, leiomyosarcoma, a rare type of cancer. Uh, you can see this ICD-10 code here, um, C49.6. Leiomyosarcoma is one of the diagnoses that gets lumped into this code but to actually know which ones truly have the leiomyosarcoma, you'd have to actually look at probably the notes themselves or pathology reports or other uh, details. Or for finding things like Bainbridge-Roper syndrome, right? So this is a Q87.0, which is a sort of collection, a grab bag of uh, different congenital malformations affecting the facial appearance, but it doesn't really narrow down to that specific syndrome. And there's hundreds of other disorders with no specific code, especially the rare ones. So if you're interested in working with cohorts, you could identify a cohort from within Emers itself. If you have a list of patients from what's even, let's say even an Excel spreadsheet, you could upload it, or you could technically import the list from another system such as ITB2. And then you have a list of patients that you can work with and you can have as many lists as you want. And each list, you can have up to 100,000 patients per list. So it's, it's pretty, pretty big that you can work with these lists. Another thing you can do uh, with Emers is you can highlight documents for chart review. So this is a human driven chart review. It's not automatic, but when you can highlight the concepts in the notes, it really helps make finding things very easy. And then you can sort of, again, look at the context and decide if that's what you're looking for. Emers does support query expansion. It doesn't do it automatically, but if you give it a term, it can uh, expand it to other terms and then give you the user the option of things that you'd like to look for. So this is an example of if you search for vaping, it will expand to all these other things like jewel pods and candy pen and who knows what all these other um, uh, kinds of things are. Uh, I do wanna talk about this briefly because people do ask about it a lot. So uh, with this query expansion, you can use what we call here our Emer synonyms, which I'll discuss in a little bit, or you can upload your own data set. This could be ICD-10 codes, human phenotype ontology, mesh terms. All you have to do is just format it in a very simple format that we have put online and then it would uh, work for all the users. The Emer synonyms themselves, this is a manually curated uh, data set built up over 12 years. Um, even though there's lots of automated tools that could sort of try to generate these things, I found that the, uh, the human annotation really sort of makes it work really well. So this has many terms and phrases not found in the standard vocabularies, taxonomies, ontologies, or, or other resources, but these things can be found in clinical notes. Um, our university is licensing this, um, but for pretty reasonable terms for academic centers, there's more than a million unique rows in it. And if you want details, I have some, some links at the bottom of this slide that you can visit to, to learn a little bit more or play around with the subset. Uh, the kind of things that are in this synonym set include things like actual acronyms like CXR for text ray, abbreviations, professional consumer terms like MSS and QKing, many misspellings of words, uh, trade and generic drug names, chemo regimens, uh, word stems, uh, true synonyms like frigid and cold, phrasing variations like lido with epi or epicane lidocaine or epi dash lidocaine because there's all these different variations. Uh, there's a fair number of these malapropisms or usage errors. So beast mass instead of breast mass or prostate cancer instead of prostate cancer. 
uh, these kind of root word variations where people sort of don't quite remember the, the, uh, the right order of the words. So they sort of make up their own in a sense. So adenotonsillectomy versus tons, tonsilloadenoidectomy, uh, various ways that hyphen words can be hyphenated. And this matters because we, uh, uh, we break up the words into their component pieces. Others uh, idi idioms like under the knife and then just plain old neologisms that people have used like trabecularity versus the actual word trabeculation. So the kind of things that we have in Emers, at least at Michigan, are uh, just free text notes. These could be admission notes, history and physical, progress notes, path, radiology reports, and more. In our system, we have about two and a half million patients, about 170 million notes dating back to around 1995, and it gets updated daily. So we have notes up through basically yesterday. Uh, there's about a one day delay um, because we index once a day. What's not in EMERS? Well, the structure data. So we don't have discrete lab values, vital signs, billing codes, things like that, because there are other tools such as I2V2 that exist for the structure data. A typical workflow of using EMERS could be identifying an initial cohort which it, with a cohort discovery tool such as I2V2, or just doing a search within EMERS where you're trying to find patients. Once you have that, you would then uh, abstract additional details using the highlights uh, feature within EMERS, and then you would store your data in another system because EMERS is not to, meant to be a data capture system, but tools like REDCap or others could be used to actually uh, store the, the data you're, you're extracting. So in my view, uh, and the reason I sort of wanted to reach out to your community in the first place is that I think I, EMERS and ITB2 could really go together like many things that go together well, like chocolate and peanut butter and cookies and milk, and, and you, you can find your own analogy. Uh, but to explain this further, uh, just imagine some scenarios where, let's say, an ITB2 query, ITB2 could query EMERS, which has this uh, solar API, for a list of patients as additional criteria. So you might set up your uh, structure data, and then uh, maybe you're saying a denote must contain some word or phrase. Uh, ITB2 can send a patient cohort to EMERS. This actually has been done before, and I'll show you some screenshots from that. Or maybe EMERS could eventually use ITB2 to narrow down the cohort using structured data such as demographics and diagnosis codes and other things. Uh, just briefly, EMERS and I2B2 have been connected in the past. So one of our uh, amazing EMERS developers a number of years ago had actually built an I2B2 plugin. And to show you how this works, and these are, these are seven-year-old screenshots, so this may not look exactly like the current system, but should give you the idea is that um, we had run a query. Uh, it said it had found 285 patients. And then uh, we had uh, gone to the plugins. Uh, he had built something called Emers Export. You would drag your um, prior uh, data set that you found to where it says drop a patient set here. Then it would actually show you the patient set. A button would appear that said export patient set to Emers. You press that button and then you've logged into Emers, which I'll show you shortly. And then this shows up basically as a patient list with the name that came from I2B2 the description said export from I2B2, and then uh, without really any more work, you can now start searching the actual uh, um, notes themselves from these patients, and then start looking at more details. So this was, this was um, based on an ICD code. This was an ICD-9 code at the time that did not distinguish different kinds of animal bites. So to actually figure out what specific animal it was, we had to then search the notes, um, even though we started using uh, I2B2 as the initial cohort discovery tool, um, and then uh, dug in deeper with the, the nodes. So Emers is very fast, and I think it's important to emphasize this. I don't know how many people on this call use Epic versus other systems. Uh, we have Epic, and Clarity is sort of the reporting database. We did some searches to compare uh, one versus the other. So um, searching for ca cavernous hemangioma in Epic took about 14,000 seconds. That's hours. I don't know exactly how many hours. But Emers was two seconds, so about 7,000 times faster. Great platelet syndrome about 7,500 times faster. And for this longer phrase, inferior, inferior lingual, lingular segment of the upper of the left upper lobe, um, it was still about 2,000 times faster. So with you know two to 10 seconds of response time, that basically enables real-time querying. So if you don't like your answer or your results, you can try it again and do it over and over again. So the, the speed really does make a difference. There's been about 358 papers and about 52 abstracts uh, that we know of so far that have um, used EMERS in some way. The full list, if you want to see it, can be found at the link below at our main website, project-emers.org. Where is EMERS currently? Well, it's currently installed here at the University of Michigan. 
It's running at the University of Cincinnati and uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And then we have a number of sites that are working on installing it right now. Uh, this includes UCSF, University of Kentucky, Case Western, and uh, Columbia University Cancer Center. The future, and we have uh, done a fair amount of work for this already, is to network it in a concept similar to the way uh, ITB2 ACT is working right now. So um, it has its own infrastructure and a lot of it's been built. It's going through security reviews and, and uh, um, still needs some more interface work done. But the general idea is that there would be a hub um, that could then uh, query other sites and get aggregated counts back that are obfuscated, uh, but sort of similar to the way ITB2 works right now, uh, but with the free text data as the source data. For people interested in Emers, uh, as I mentioned before, local installation is required and you do need support of your IT team. IT team. Uh, it is EHR agnostic. It runs independent of the EHR and of course you would need a way to extract documents to send to Emers if you wanted to get it running. Uh, for those interested in some of the technical under the hood details, it is uh, uh, based mainly on Java, JavaScript for the um, web front end. It is web browser based. It uses Apache Solar, Apache ActiveMQ, and it does use Oracle. At this point, it is currently only Oracle for the database, but hopefully someday we'll be able to expand to others. If you're interested in test driving it, we do have an online demo I can give you an account for. We have videos on our website, and we can also send you a virtual machine that uh, you can sort of play around with, break, uh, and sort of see how it's all put together, which could actually be used for individual projects. So if you have like a set of, you know, 50,000 notes you want to load in for a specific project, you could use that virtual machine even if your local institution didn't install it sort of at an enterprise level. Uh, our main website for this is project emerseorg where we have a user guide, we've got videos, lots of documentation, and other details. For any information about this, you can just contact me. It's Hanauer at umich.edu. So it's my last name at umich.edu. And then I do, of course, want to acknowledge all the support we've had for this, including uh, various parts of our own institution at Michigan, as, law, as well as the uh, NCI's um, Informatic Technology for Cancer Research um, uh, program, which has been really instrumental in helping us get this uh, disseminated to other sites. So I'll pause for a little bit to take any questions you have about this, and then I can move on to the, uh, the live demo. There, there's one question that was typed in from Keith. Keith, do you want to ask directly? You can just unmute yourself. I'll see if I can also go to the uh, chat. There we go. Found the mute button. There you are. You got it. Going through the Emerge site, this looks like a, a really great application. Uh, I think it's great that you're using the Apache 2 license, but it seems that the Cinnamon data is like a restricted license. <laughs> can you explain the rationale for that? Uh, this was working with our. Um, tech transfer people, you know, just, I guess, finding some ways to, uh, to, I guess, get some, something back for all this. I mean, I, I, I would, will acknowledge that um, if it does get licensed, I am able to get a cut of that myself because it's been built by me. Um, but uh, the idea is that it's not necessary to run the system so you can sort of load your own stuff in. And it's actually um, been many thousands of hours of work. So it's, it's, you know, like, Many projects I've worked on are sort of like you do it, you run your study, and um, you know you can put your data set out there. This is sort of actually hours of work every single day. So um, to hand curate such a large list and to sort of find new new terms is is a tremendous amount of work. And and what are those the licensing terms for say academic versus say like a for profit hospital system or or something of that nature? So. Uh, I am not sure exactly because I'm not the one who handles that, but my understanding was that uh, I think for academic, I'd have to look, but I think what they said was it was 2,500 for the first year, then 500 for subsequent years, and that was for enterprise level use. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's, it's very impressive. Uh, I like it very much. Thanks for the work. Thank hey, you. David, David, this is Sean. This is really nice work. Um, that you've done here over many years. Um, you know, gearing up towards our uh, emergency here, uh, I'm wondering, you know, these kinds of deep text analysis tools might serve a unique purpose where they can really dive in and look at very specific things that people are gonna wanna know and have reported on. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm wondering, um, you know, you certainly having up-to-date data is gonna be like, you know, really important part of that. Um, and you say in your um, um, installation, it's updated every day. Um, and is that, and one, is that through like, you know, HL7 messages that are coming to you or how is that happening exactly or the Clarity download? And two, do you know if the other sites, uh, South Carolina, uh, University of Cincinnati, um, are they also updating it once a day? So, so that's a good question. Um, I don't think the other sites are updating it once a day. That's really up to their own policies and how well they can access it. I will say that the way that we get our data is probably a bit unusual. Um, so because we've had an HIE since we went live with Epic in the first place, what we've actually been doing is we've been sort of, um, and we send all of our documents to the HIE, we've actually been forking off um, one of those feeds and just taking the documents that way. At the same time, people could get their documents from Clarity because uh, Clarity is also updated once a day, so you could you could do an extract of documents from there. The there are some challenges though, um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, basically, all of the default Clarity data stores for free text they have stripped out the formatting, which means that a user will not see the document in the way that it actually looked on on the screen within Epic. Um, there are ways that you could actually um, set up another table within Clarity to actually get the um, the sort of the original source data, which is in, I think, uh, I believe it's RTF format. Um, but it's does, it doesn't seem to be done anywhere, um, even though it could be done. We are also working with the uh, University of Utah. Uh, they are working on um, some sort of fire enabled uh, ways to try to get documents uh, out of the system in sort of a more bulk fashion to make it easier to do. Um, mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we don't really have any good solutions about document extraction. We just, you know, if you can get your documents out and you can load it into Emerse, you can even do it in real time if you wanted, but we do it once a, once every night. Sure. And from the HIE, does it look like HL7? It is HL7, yes. It is, okay. Yes. All right, that is excellent. Thank you very much, David. Sure. Okay, right. so is there a link to the source code anywhere on the website? Yeah, so this is one of those crazy things where, um, at least at this point, our hospital IT group, which is probably one of the most conservative groups in the country, uh, does not want to just make it publicly available because they're afraid that some hacker is going to get it and find a way in. So if you want the source code, email me and I'll send it to you. Um, I'm hoping at some point we can get it actually just posted for everybody, but um, all you have to do is send me an email. I'll send you the link to download it. Thanks. Okay, let me um, try to share my web browser now. Let's see here. Okay, so what I have now is um, I'm hoping you can see my web browser, which says Emerse and a login screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk you through this pretty quickly. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I just want to give you a sense of of how this, this works. Um, what I'm showing you now is something that's running on a virtual machine off of my laptop. Uh, every patient name is fake. Every thing that you see that's clinical is fake. Well, the clinical stuff, there's no actual notes in here. These are all either PubMed abstracts or um, open uh, access case reports from some journals I found online. So just so you know, you're not seeing patient information. Okay, so I'm gonna log in. Uh, when I log in, the very first thing that uh, people get to is what we call an attestation page. This is so that we can log the usage for each session. Uh, we have a free text box. Uh, if you can't find your reason there, uh, we have some quick buttons if it's sort of a common use case uh, among uh, sort of hospital operations. And then we pull in data from our electronic IRB system so that each individual um, person would see their current valid IRB approved studies that they can select from so that when, uh, if somebody ever asked what were they using it for, then we can provide this uh, detail for them. So in this case, I'll just click where it says um, demonstration because this system is not connected to an IRB approved study. Okay, and what I have here is um, I have sort of the main screen where it says, um, right now it's going across all patients which are 10,000 in this demo system. 
all dates, which uh, for, you know, here it's like about 12 years or so of data. And then I'm on this quick terms thing, which is a, a text box, sort of like the way Google works. So just to show you quickly, I'm just gonna type in nephrectomy. So I type in nephrectomy, I click on the button called find patients. And very quickly, it goes across um, this demo data. There's, I think there's about 500,000 notes in this demo system. And it basically says it found 500 patients that match the criteria. What it does is it, for the, about the top 100 um, documents it found, it just shows me some little snippets of text so I can read the context and decide if that's what I'm looking for or not. We have a tab here called demographics, which just breaks down this cohort it found based on sex, current age, uh, race, and ethnicity. And then we have a trends feature here, which uh, again, since this is all just sort of random, it's not much of a trend, but this shows a uh, date, um, uh, in this case by years, and then how many unique patients in each sort of, uh, in this case year, mention the word nephrectomy. So that gives us um, an example of how, how this can work. Um, I'm just gonna try to do something really quick here. Uh, let's see if this works. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you can see the screen. I just did uh, this yesterday. This is off of our production data set. We're actually searched for some variations of, um, you know, COVID-19, et cetera. And uh, you can see here that when, uh, hopefully you can see the screen, you know, when the first case was mentioned, it wasn't being, or diagnosed, it wasn't mentioned in all of our notes. And then around the time that it was actually diagnosed here in Michigan, it just started getting, you know, exploding. Now, these are not the actual number of cases because this is just mentioned in the notes. And this does sort of I emphasize- think we're, Sorry, David, I don't think we're seeing that graph. Oh, you don't see it? Um, we're seeing the old one, yeah. The old one, let's see. The reflect the effect oh. to me graph, yeah. You know what I need to do? Um, I probably need to, let me just stop sharing for a second and I'll share that one. Yeah. Let's see. Here. Okay. Maybe. Sorry. There we go. Yeah. Um, there you go. So this is this is based on our live data from from yesterday, where you know it was probably mentioned for a little bit. People are probably saying I'm concerned about this. So that the mention of something itself does not mean they have it because we don't have that many patients in our healthcare system with it, which is why human aided chart review helps in these kind of cases. Or of course, if you want natural language processing, you can do that too. But this just it's just showing you how these trends are working and, and the fact that it really was barely being mentioned and then there's sort of been an explosion um, of these cases over the last uh, few days. And uh, um, now it goes down towards the end on, on March 14th. This may be because uh, for our EMER system, we don't put in notes unless they've been signed. So if they're uh, interim notes, we don't, we don't bring them in. And it also may be just that people are starting to stay away who don't really need to uh, be coming in, so it may be for that reason as well. I don't know, but this is just to kind of show, you know, you can get these sort of trend features on, on pretty up-to-date data. Okay, let me go back to the other screen again. Let's see here. Okay, so let's see. So hopefully you all are back on the, the other system I was on. Yes, looks fine. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is gonna go back to terms. I'm gonna add another term, since I'm still in this fine patient mode nephrectomy hematuria, find patients. What this is doing right now is that um, because I'm in the find patients mode, and I'm not gonna get into all the details of how this works, but by default, uh, especially if the terms are different colors, it's basically an end. So find all patients that have nephrectomy and hematuria in their notes together. So what I can do is, um, it's now down to 53 patients. I can click a button called move it to a temporary patient list. This allows me to work with these patients uh, for this session, but since it's temporary, if I log out, it's gone. Um, and then now in the upper left-hand corner, it says temporary patient list with 53 patients. If I click on highlight documents, I'm now in sort of this highlight document mode where it's going to show me what it found for each patient. So in this view here, every row is one of the patients in that list I just generated. The columns are the document sources. So these are configurable for each site. Uh, so it depends on how many sources you want or how you want to sort of group things together. Uh, but for example, what it's saying, for example, is this first patient, uh, Vivan, uh, under the main EHR category, one document out of 10 has those two terms in it. So I can click on that cell and drill down. And now I can see uh, the snippet from that particular note. It actually is pulling back all the notes because I may want to read around that note for context. But with one more click, I can actually get to the note itself. And then it will actually highlight these terms with those colors. So if I see yellow, I know it's nephrectomy. If I say blue, I know it's the hematuria. And that way I can sort of drill down into this uh, further. Okay, 
So that was sort of a way I can very quickly go from identify a set of patients with some terms and then drill down to the actual notes themselves. What I'm gonna switch to next is a patient list I've made before because I know this works well for demos. I'm gonna click on this one called demo list which has 16 patients. Now what I wanna show you briefly is that for a saved patient list, these are lists that I can uh, use over and over again. If I log out, it will still be there. If I have a research team, I can share this with other people on the team so I can specify specific users of the system that I'd like to share it with. Uh, and then we also have this, uh, this thing here called a comment and a tag. This is basically so that when people are going through and doing their chart reviews, they can add a little comment. It could be a question or anything they want. A tag is basically a checkbox. It could be something that you wanna say, these are, this one's eligible for a study or this one should be deleted, whatever it is. Um, and, but it's saved and those comments and tags are shared among the users. So if you have five people on your team that are working off the list, it all is um, being uh, merged together in just for that patient list. So everybody's comments and tags would, would go together. Okay. Then we had a couple of questions. Could I just interrupt you for a second uh, asking about, these are all fully identified patients? The, the way the eMERS, yeah. So the way that yeah. eMERS works at this point is that it's for fully identified. So that uh, this would be for people at an institution who have the rights to look at it. For right. the networking part that we're working on, the idea is that you would only get an obfuscated count, of course, with thresholds below a certain level that you would not get any result back. Okay. We are, uh, our future plans are to build a, at least functionality that they can handle de-identified documents. But the truth is, is that I don't think any institution, even if they're de-identified, would ever make these data available to others because there's, there, these, these de-identification de systems are not perfect. So, but it helps at least protect patient privacy. But yes, currently this is for uh, fully identified um, data. Is, was there another question? Uh, I think that, Matt, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, thank you very much. Okay, super, uh, thank to, you. To, the, to, to the last comment, I don't, I don't know if I agree, actually, uh, we're pushing very hard at Trinetics to do something uh, very similar to what you're doing. I absolutely love the demo. Uh, the, uh, the, the, idea, the idea is great, just great. Thank you. All right, so let me go back. So I, um, I'm gonna just now here go just, I'll type in shingles. So here's my patient list. I can see where shingles is within a click and a click. Now I'm in that note and I can see exactly where this uh, is, you know, down below where it says, you know, shingles on his trunk. I can edit a whole bunch of terms. So I can do shingles, I can do uh, reflux. I can do the phrase mitral valve prolapse, uh, seizures, seizures, Lasix, bowel obstruction, whole bunch of terms, cancer, hepat hepatitis, lymphocytes, treatment, highlight documents. Now, before I press the highlight documents, since I'm in this mode where it's a known set of patients, these are now sort of or, so it's shingles or reflux or the phrase mitral valve prolapse, it's just gonna highlight whatever it finds anywhere. You can see here that this table is now much more densely populated. We have sort of like a heat map. So the darker the color, it just found more documents. So it gives you a sense of that it found more information. But when you have this many terms, what I really like is um, what we call a mosaic view, which is what it does here is it actually matches up the colors in each cell with the colors of the terms so that you can very quickly see what it found. So for example, that first patient, Gabriel Dudley in main EHR, I see dark blue, so I know cancer appears there. I see a green, so it looks like maybe the word treatment. And of course, now I can see these things in their notes. So that way, with a very quick high level overview, if I wanna find where Lasix appears, all I need to do is find that sort of pinkish magenta color. Scroll down, scroll down, it's gotta be here somewhere. Was it not here? Oh, no, here it is, I missed it. Here's Lasix, boom, boom. Now I'm in the document with Lasix. So it's a very quick way to be able to sort of find things uh, very quickly and easily. Um, I don't want to get into it now, but we do have a way to do um, some wildcard searching. So if you don't know the word ending, you can do a, use a little asterisk for wildcards. Um, if you want to do a case sensitive match, you can. So for things like ALL for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, you can say only search for the capitalized ALL because by default the searches are case insensitive. Um, I do want to show you how this um, uh, 
um, the synonyms works in this case. So if, if I search for liver cancer, I can see this in just one place. Uh, but if I click on the term, it's going to let me um, have more options here. Um, I have full control, so I can de-highlight them and sort of pick what I want. Uh, or I can highlight them all and pick the ones I don't want. So maybe the word cancer is just too broad. I just click Add Highlighted Terms. Now I click Highlight Documents. Now it's going to find other uh, variations of things. So for example, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or HEC. So I can sort of expand that out. Uh, let me just see here. Um, and there's a lot of this. So I think, you know, I had shown you, uh, you know, vaping. I don't know if there's any vaping in these notes. Um, in this, whoops, I spelled this wrong. Terms. Not there. Of course, I can expand that out. Even has things like cigarettes and stuff like that. Or I can even just put in the word tobacco. I find that in a few places. Uh, I expand this out. You can see a whole lot of different terms related to tobacco. Um, including some of these spelling errors at the bottom. In this case, I'll just click Add Highlighted Terms. I'll throw them all in there, choose Highlight Documents, and now I'll probably find uh, a bunch of other things that um, I might have missed otherwise. So, for example, here we have smoking status, pack years, um, you know, smoker, smoking status, etc. Now, there will be false positives here because, you know, it doesn't know the context. It's not a you know, an AI natural language processing machine, but it does um, help uh, find things. Now, I do want to show you briefly that um, something that we actually don't have running here, but could be done. I've just done it for a demonstration, which is um, you can take scan documents and then um, uh, you can then search those scan documents if you run OCR or optical character recognition on that. So here we have some scan PDFs where I'm looking for Quest Diagnostics. And then I have a link to the original PDF. And that way, you know, it has found, I don't know if you can see this or not because um, of the way that the browser is working. I'll, let me just share this screen really quick. Share screen. Um, here we go. Because it opened up in a new window. But this is a scan document where the OCR found Quest Diagnostics in the notes. So that's a way that you can actually search um, uh, this, this information as well. Let me go back into the main thing here, share screen and back. Okay. Um, now, another thing that I think is really useful for people is that we have something called a term bundle, which is basically a safe search. Um, this is a way that you can um, reuse a search. You can share it with people in your research team so you're all standardized. And people who have published have actually published these sort of term lists um, in their appendices to help with reproducibility. But to show you how this works, for example, I have one here called exercise that they made. It's as simple as clicking on it, click uh, highlight documents, and now I can find, whoops, I clicked on the wrong button. I'm going too fast. Uh, physical activity, walking, aerobic, cycling, et cetera. Now, again, here the context was wrong because the aerobic was for um, bacteria and the cycling was for temperature cycling, but um, at least it's helping you figure out where these things may be uh, quickly. Another thing you can do with these bundles is um, uh, you can color code things. So in this case, we made all these constipating terms the same color, purple, uh, laxatives, stool softeners in orange, and then some of the narcotics in green. And that way, just by seeing the color, I can know exactly what the, the context is um, by seeing this. So for example, I know that uh, for this patient, uh, Gabriel Dudley for pathology, um, some of those um, you know, methadone appears. If I go down, uh, further, I might see, well, let's see, I can go here and I can see psyllium, metamucil, oxycodone, roxycodone, et cetera. But I know based on the colors exactly what the terms, the kind of term it is just because I've color coded it. Uh, I think with that, I'll probably stop. Um, there is more you can do if you want to do complex Boolean searches like this and this or that or that. You could do that kind of stuff. Uh, but overall, it's really meant to be a simple system. Um, it doesn't do everything for everyone, but it should do a lot of things for most people. Um, and again, uh, it's something that I think probably could work well sort of as a um, uh, sort of another tool that can work well with ITB2 um, and just something for you to think about and consider. And I think with that, I'll stop if, in case anybody has more questions or wants to see anything else. Okay, thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can just unmute yourself and uh,
Or if you'd like to type it into the chat window, that's fine. I am looking at the chat, bo chat box now. Great, great. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you. I think it was an excellent demo. I think very interesting system that uh, everyone, I'm sure, will come back and review the uh, the recording. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks and again, if, if anybody has more questions, you can just email me privately. If you would like um, uh, to have the source code, I can send you that. I can send you the virtual machine with things running on it. Or if you'd like another demonstration for people in your own group or your own institution, just let me know. And we can set up something similar for, for them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Diane, any closing remarks? I just wanted to um, thank uh, David very much for the, um, the presentation. I think this is pretty exciting. Um, and, and also Kavi for, for uh, even though the AMIA was canceled, I'm sure that was gonna be a great um, session. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to having some some additional uh, maybe workshops and things um, as part of the foundation. So it's wonderful. So I just wanted to, to say, you know, everybody uh, stay safe, wash your hands, all that kind of stuff. And um, we will um, talk to you next month.